Bible, look over to the book of Galatians with me, Galatians, and we'll look at chapter 4 tonight. During the holidays, I want to encourage you, think about others, uh, and that doesn't mean just buying things for others, it means be good to the waitress, be patient in the line at Walmart when it's too crowded, and when some little kid's racing through the store acting like a crazy person. Remember, his parents have parked him in front of a television 10 hours a day, and the kid's an idiot. And... Um, just like his parents are. Um, what a mess the holidays can make of us. And then you jam the kid full of sugar and all that kind of stuff. So be good to people during the holidays, even a little more. We ought to always be good to people, but especially during the holidays. Galatians chapter 4, we're going to just kind of drift through here. Um, um, we'll s skip back to a couple of verses in chapter 3. And uh, let's just start here. Um, again, Paul's writing to the uh, the churches, plural, there's a, there's a, it's a big area. There's a lot of people. He's trying to keep doctrine straight. Let me just say a word about the offering tonight that uh, Brother Josh is telling you about. Latin America is under siege. They're, they're, uh, the, the churches there are literally under attack. They're challenging the Bible and the authority of the Bible, they're bringing in other versions of the Bible. They're bringing in the contemporary music. They're bringing a worldly lifestyle. Everything that's in America all of the worldliness, all of the compromises in America, it ripples out to all the other countries who want to be like us. And um, Brother, uh, Brother Fernandez, Ezekiel Salazar from up here in, in Ontario, and uh, Brother Parada from Long Beach, and Luis Ramos down in Mexico, and Tommy Ashcraft, these men, they have championed uh, old-fashioned soul winning and church building uh, for years and years and years and uh, their only limit is finances because they go into a community to have a big meeting and where do you put all the people and those poor pastors uh, making hardly any money at all they don't have big churches they don't have f big facilities and and so uh, our support of something like that is so good but anyway uh, Galatians 4 now I say that the heir as long as he is a child differeth nothing uh, from a servant though he be lord of all now remember we talked about last week um, how he's using illustrations to explain you once you were under the law and now you're not under the law. If you want to go back to verse, uh, just about five verses before, um, he, he talks about the schoolmaster um, in uh, verse 23. Before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. We talked last week that the law was to teach us, to bring us from uh, a time of, of uh, the law was to reveal to us how sinful we are, how much we needed Christ, and it was to bring us to the point of living by faith and trusting wholly in the blood of Christ. And once you get here, you don't need the schoolmaster. You don't need the law. The law, the purpose of the law, by the law, we'll read later, is, is the knowledge of sin. The law is here to show us how we can't do it on our own. The law is here to reveal to us, whoa, do I need Jesus? So you get to Jesus, well, I don't need it anymore. The law's purpose is fulfilled in bringing me to Christ. Same story, new illustration, uh, like a teacher, I mean like an heir in verse 1 of chapter 4. Um, the, uh, some rich person um, take uh, the president's son and if the president were to die and leave a bunch of money or businesses to his, uh, his son, the, the uh, younger, the preteen son, um, he wouldn't be able to walk into a corporate office and tell any CEO what to do and fire staff and all. He'd, he would be nothing different than a servant for a while. So we're, that's what he's the illustration. Uh, though he is the owner, he'd still be under, verse 2, he's under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law, that we might be, receive the adoption of sons. And so he's explaining again another, all this is another way of explaining just like a child to a, a rich person is just like a hired servant being told what to do. We were under the law. Uh, the law was our schoolmaster. The law was like 
a tutor or a teacher to bring us to Christ so that we would come to Christ and receive the gift of eternal life and then receive all that comes with it. Look at verse 6. And now as sons, God has sent forth his spirit, the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, therefore thou art no more a servant but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. And so again, just a simple illustration. We, uh, the law was not there to save. The law was there to bring you somewhere and to help you understand and to help you gain this intimate relationship with the, the, the Holy Spirit and with the Father. A couple of quick thoughts if you look there. When the fullness of time in verse 4, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son. And just to, uh, has nothing to do with the actual uh, lesson here tonight, but God has a timetable. You can trust him. God has a timetable and um, for several hundred years, actually from when Nehemiah and Ezra came back to rebuild the, the temple and the city walls when the city of Jerusalem was rebuilt, um, the uh, Haggai and Zechariah, all that went on hundreds of years past. And there was never a king. They had, they had walls, they had a temple, but there was no king. There was no, there was no established nation. They were there, but they didn't quite get it back because there wasn't going to be another king until the king of kings came. And, and Israel went through this, this whole empty time from the end of Malachi to Matthew, a big time of question and what's going on. And then along comes a guy named John the Baptist. Then it's some a Baptist is the one who shows up, uh, shaking up everybody. And John the Baptist, it wasn't John the Catholic, in case you're wondering, or John the Presbyterian, just want you to know that. And uh, John comes up preaching and everybody, man, I wonder if this is the Messiah. And he's, no, no, I'm not him. I'm not even worthy to tie his shoes. But one's going to come. And, and all the anticipation of Jesus coming. And then as Jesus began to heal and do the miracles, and people step back and think, I wonder if he is the Messiah. But it, there's a timetable. And the people of God, we always want it now. You know, if we're single, we want to get married now. If we're married, we want babies now. If we have babies, we want them to stop crying now. <laughs> uh, oh, man. Um, if, uh, if you're carrying a child, you want to deliver it now. And if you have kids, you want them to go to school now. If you're in school, you want them to graduate now. If, you want them, if they graduate, you want them out of college and on their own, well, they'll pay their own stinking bills. And then your house is empty and then you cry because all the kids are gone. We're a mess. We're a mess. I love that we can trust him when the fullness of time has come. God said, just take your time. I've got the date. I've got the place. Clear back in Malachi and Micah 5-2. He said in Bethlehem, Ephrathah, little tiny town among the thousands of Judah. He said, I've got the place. I've got the girl. I've got the situation all laid out. And we're sitting here so impatient and so panic-stricken. And what is God doing? And, and, and I, I remember we were in the tent for all those years. We, we put up the tent. And it was only going to be up for a, just maybe a year or two. And we were going to build our building. Well, that didn't work. And uh, we were five years in a tent on the property on Cat Road. And then we moved over here. And we were another four and a half years in a tent here in the back parking lot. If you count all the timing and everything together, nine and a half years. But, uh, but I remember we had the tent up, and boy, the frustration and the rain and the, and the mess and the mud and the, everything from rattlesnakes to possums. And, and I remember thinking, God, what are you doing? And then I, it really hit me one day. This is all for me. This is all about me learning to wait on God. And I thought, ah, that's it. I trust you. So now I get my building, right? <laughs> Uh, we got the grandkids with us, and, and uh, Colin, he's four, and he was a little whining a little bit. I said, you know what? Nobody that's whining gets to play any games when we get home. He said, I'm not whining, Papa. <laughs> I said, well, if you're not whining, then we don't need to worry about playing games. He said, oh. <laughs> That's exactly the ocean I felt. You know, now that I'm trusting you, do I get my building? Four and a half years later, and uh, I got where I hated the tent. 
And, but then I got over it, and I got where I accepted it. And that's when I felt like I got the victory. We're going to get it. But in when the fullness of time, and, and all of us, we think we know. We think we know the best timing. We think we know the best for our health. We think we know it's best for our retirement. We think we know it's best with, him, with jobs and kids and all that crazy stuff. But I just want to tell you, even when it comes to Jesus, God's timing is perfect. He knows exactly what he's doing. And then anyway, nothing to do with the law and the lessons here, but God said it, so I thought it'd be worth talking about since God said it. And in verse 6, again, not on the subject of the law, bringing us to grace and teaching us, uh, just being a tool to remind us and to bring us to our knees in verse 6. But because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, yeah, we are no more servants but a son. You are not some isolated character that doesn't matter. And again, let me go back and make sure you understand. When I say um, that the, the law was our schoolmaster and the law treated us like we were uh, the heirs but we still weren't charged, didn't mean the law saved us. It's just the law was a tool to bring us to the humility, to bring us to to the knowledge that I can't do this on my own. Nobody ever got saved by keeping the law because nobody ever kept the law. Just so you understand, I don't want to mis communicate here. But this thing in verse 6 and verse 7, uh, he sent his spirit, the spirit of his son into our hearts. When you got saved, you got the Holy Spirit. If you're 12 tonight, you have as much of God as I do. And he's right there wanting to guide you and direct you. I was listening today to the testimony of a preacher, um, uh, William Borden, uh, listening, reading, sorry about that. Um, I was listening to myself read it. But uh, William Borden, as a young man, got saved, grew up in a Christian home, and got saved, and in his teen years, it just became so real to him that God was his God. And that there was a purpose in his life for God. And he wanted to fulfill that purpose. And he wanted to do something for God. And as a teenager, well, the passion began to burn in his heart. And miracles went on in his life. He went to Yale. And, and at Yale, he literally turned that college upside down with Bible studies and prayer meetings. And he started out with a handful of people and went out reaching more and more of the, of the student body and got where he had hundreds and hundreds. And basically, the vast majority of the campus was coming to his, his Bible studies and prayer meetings because a young person got it in, down in his heart, this is my God. God is not an adult person's God. God's a Christian's God. And he cares about you and he has a plan for you. And in verse 7, uh, you're not just a servant but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. How be it then, when you, in verse 8, when you knew not God, you did service to them which by nature are no gods. We've just like we've talked about in our cults lessons. Where when before we're a child of God, we're worshiping every kind of stupid thing, whether it be our own opinion. You ever ever asked an, an atheist to explain their atheism? So what do you believe? They don't know. So what's going to happen when you die? I mean, they, they, I'm an agnostic. Really, could you define that? Anyway, they don't want to do that either. What a mess. But we're out there chasing after all these things, and you know what? None of them have. None of them have. Verse 6 and verse 7. He's my God. And his spirit lives inside me. And it, when before we came to Christ, we got all this foolishness, all this nonsense. The, the bumper sticker the, it was popular some years ago. He who dies with the most toys wins. What a ridiculous statement. I mean, absolute insanity. I remember walking up to a guy's car that had that, and I wrote a note on the back of a track. He wins nothing. He'll go to hell. Love you in Jesus' name. <laughs> what a dumb thing. You don't win anything unless you win Christ. Man, what a crazy... But, but he said, we serve things that weren't even God's. Verse 9, now, after that you have known God, or rather, are known of God... Now, he's coming into this, remember the thing we read already in chapter 3? They're playing with, they got saved by grace, they saw the passion of God, the work of God, but they're turning back around thinking, wow, we better keep the law, we better do this, and we better do that. 
and uh, and and he said what are you thinking here in verse uh, verse 9 that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto you desire again to be in bondage you observe days and months and times and years he said I'm afraid of you lest I bestowed on you labor in vain and and Paul says look I brought you from this empty world of nothing to an intimacy with Christ and you have him and you know him and he loves you he knows you and you know him what in the world do you want to go back into that for you know it's funny remember the story when uh, the uh, some of the Jewish the Pharisees that got saved they, they went over to Antioch and they were trying to convince them you need to keep the law and follow the law they were already saved they're already they already had a good church there. that's where they were first called Christians and then the Paul and and others came back and had this big discussion and finally Peter and James and others they wrote a letter and sent the letter back to the church at Antioch all right we understand you're Gentiles you don't need to keep the law and then they said but here's things you do have to do if, if you read that story it's ridiculous keep from things strangled keep from blood keep from this keep from this and I thought you know what we were messed up from the beginning you ever wonder whether so many churches because God let men run it and I don't mean men versus women okay women will mess it up just as much but we're what is wrong with us why can't we just read it and believe it what's wrong with you don't be getting in, in Paul in verse 11 I I'm afraid for you, lest I've bestowed upon you labor in vain. Can I just say something to you young people, and maybe some of you adults who have Christian parents? Somebody put an awful lot of time into you. Don't let it be in vain. You know, Brother Steve Rowe here, I don't know how many years he's been coming. 30 years? 25 years? 31 years. There's a lot of patience putting up with Brother Steve. <laughs> a lot of Sunday school teachers. A lot of a lot of time and investment in his youth and you know what he's proving that all that labor was not in vain and and those of you young people who are here right now your parents have put a lot into you and your teachers and your coaches and uh, can I just say it's not your own life you owe a lot of people you know this idea what's well, my life I can do what I want well not really now, God will give you the free will, and you can go be stupid, and you can go be a drunk, and you can get out of church, and you can do a whole lot of things. And by the way, you can come back, and he'll love you, and uh, we will love you. But I just want you to know, there's a whole bunch of us who've invested and invested and invested labor. You know how many candy bars we have bought? Brother Ray, do you know how many candy bars you bought? The man who knows every number does not know that number. I, I bought three boxes of candy bars this candy sale. There's a lot of money invested in you teenagers. Um, can, how many senior? I've been on, I think I've been on 28 senior trips. 75, I think I counted, camps. I go to camp because I love sleeping on beds that have no mattress. And we've got workers here, you know, like Paul and Kathy Bailey. They started going to camps and they just never quit. They just grew, they just grew up. How many camps? How many camps John and Rubio's been to? And Sandra have been to camps. And, and so many of our people have been to junior camp and teen camp. You understand? I remember Dave Matuzak being at camp not long ago. He got so sick of the teenagers, he went home early. Um, it was a winter camp. He was really sick. I said, get out of here. I don't want everybody sick at camp. But somebody's invested in you. And Paul was reminding the people in Galatia, don't you get your doctrine messed up. And, like I said, if you do understand this, get back here. Get back in church and get back faithful. But look for with me for a minute. In verse 11 and verse 12, I'm afraid for you, lest I bestowed upon you labor in vain. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are, and ye have not injured me at all. Now, you know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel to you at first, and in my temptation 
which was in my flesh. So Paul has a physical infirmity. A lot of people believe it was his eyes, some other things, but it doesn't matter what. God didn't designate it. But he said, I, through my sickness, my physical problems, I preach. And, and in verse 14, he says, you receive me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where is then the blessedness you spoke of? So obviously, when, when Paul, back years ago, when Paul came to Galatians, started winning souls and started churches, they said, this is like having God here. This guy is so awesome. And he said, where's the blessedness that you talked about? Remember how thrilled you were to be at a church where people were being saved and baptized and the teen choirs packed out with teenagers? You remember the blessing? Remember the, the wow of all of it? Look as he goes on. He said in verse 15, where's the blessedness you spake of? For I bear your record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. That's one of the inklings that it perhaps was his eyes, but it doesn't matter. Verse 16, am I there before become your enemy? Because I tell you the truth. And if we can just stop there for a minute, can I say this to all of you in leadership? You, are, you and I are to do what we're supposed to do because we're supposed to do it not because everybody responds because if the apostle paul could invest and invest and invest and invest and somehow use at least the illustration am i become your enemy because i tell you the truth what kind of things are being said about him what kind of accusations were being thrown at him what kind of inappropriate um slander was being bannered around and he says, you know, where was the blessedness? Do you remember how it all started? Do you remember the, the wonder of your Christian life? Don't get, don't get critical of me. Can I just say to all of you in leadership, somebody's going to be critical of you. And it might be your children. It might be somebody that you've worked with in the ministry. Or it might be some Christian you've invested a ton of time in. How many times has somebody invested and invested in, in some Christian and then gone off uh, they've gone off in some crazy direction. Um, we're going to start churches. We've got, uh, I've been praying patiently and I've been talking to one pastor, might be the one to help us start our next church. Uh, like Brother Surface, we want to keep starting churches. That is the New Testament pattern. But over the years as we've started churches, there's some of those churches, they, they wouldn't come to our church now. I'm not going to quit starting churches we financed their building we paid for their tracks we went and knocked on doors for them week after week and month after month anyway but we didn't do it so they'd be good to us we did it because it was right and as a parent sometimes you can get thinking what's wrong with my kids they're human they got it from their dad by the way and don't you quit serving God if your child quits following you. Don't you walk out on your Christian faith if somebody that you've worked with and loved walks off. One of the saddest stories I know of, I've got a, I've got a book in my library. You may have a copy of it because he preached here and he sold some books. Very, very successful missionary. And he came, I mean, I'm going to say 10 or 15 years in the Missionville, great ministry. He came back to the States because he had some huge opportunities. And he said, I just need manpower. I need some, I need some money and I need some help. And he spent, I'm going to say, almost a year looking for help. And he was here and, and we, we'd supported him. And he didn't get what he thought he, he needed. And he went back, packed up his family, came back to the States, and he quit on God. And he just, he just walked out walked out of the ministry and I think you know what I'm not here because of you and if you all aren't here next week all I can say is thank God the mortgage is paid off <laughs> I can start filling this building up again but I can't start paying the mortgage off <laughs> but you know as a parent you ought to you ought to decide one thing if my kids ever want to come back they're going to know where to find me I'll be right where I've always been. And if somebody down the road 
that walked away from our values that we taught them. If they decide down the road uh, that they want to redo some things, you know what? We want to be right where we were when they left. Because like the Apostle Paul, it's going to happen. We're human and we're frail. And, and don't be hard on people. And I'm not saying I've never done it. I'm saying I shouldn't do it because we're all flesh. And Paul's wrestling with this thing. He's, but, you know, Paul has no problem. Can, I said something to somebody once some time ago, and he got really offended. I said, you know what? I didn't want to say it, but I thought it. You owe everything you've got to me. I can say any stinking thing I want. I didn't say that, nor did I say a lot of things I wanted to say. It's not my business. Um, who art thou to, to uh, judge your brother, another man's servant, Paul wrote in Romans. But it happens. It happens. And don't panic. Don't you take all the blame because you just give it your very best shot. And then you go on and give it your very best shot the next time. And give it your very best shot the next time. I love the story of Laternal. If you, you boys, every mom in here that's got a boy ought to get the biography of Laternal and have your kids read that. And I don't know if you check it first. I don't know how clean it is. I know I was a Christian multi-millionaire inventor almost every piece of heavy equipment in the world was invented by Laternal and he'd be rich and a millionaire and then he'd keep investing investing and he'd lose it all and he'd be flat broke and then he'd be rich and rich and rich and then he'd lose it all and he'd be flat broke you know what you're not we don't write on the top of this thing and uh, the fact is there's some pretty great people who've had some pretty big drop off so let's just keep on so he says in verse 16 am i become your enemy because i tell you the truth but i want you to notice and in verse 17 yea they they zealously affect you but not well yea they would exclude you that ye might affect them now let me try to explain that from a pastor's perspective because i think he's writing this to preachers as much as anybody here i am i'm just, I'm your pastor in Wildemar. I've been here 35 years. There are people in America who would love to reach out and get me philosophically to move over to where they are. They would zealously and passionately try to move me so it would make them look good. Not because it'll help me. Because it'll make them look good. Um, and, and the devil would love to get you. He'd love to take you and draw you. Look at, look at that verse again. He says, if I can get my glass on, I can read a little better. Uh, they, they zeal, verse 17, they zealously affect you, but not well. It's not helping you. Yea, they would exclude you. They want to pull you out from where you are that ye might affect them. They want, but the, the other crowd wants to get you, you young people, the worldly crowd of churches would like nothing more than to pull you from soul winning and pull you from bus ministry and pull you from jail ministry and pull you from rest home ministry and pull you from, from uh, actively. Well, why would anybody throw a fit and preach sermons against tithing? I mean, can we get in trouble by giving too much to God? But you see, if they can get you to give up your old-fashioned values and come over here, it makes them look so good. And they'll zealously affect you. We, we quit going to, to uh, one place we used to play ball many years ago because our folks, of course, many of you, we go to watch our kids play ball. And I thought, I, I watch our church members, and I thought, these staff members of this place are like vultures circling our members trying to capture my thing. I don't even want to be around you guys. And that's what the world will do. That's what churches, that's what pastors are under that all the time. You know, what's the, what's the glory in trying to get a pastor to change his faith? What's the point? But you know what? Preachers do it all the time. And trying desperately to draw a guy, and it's always trying to draw him to the left. Always trying to draw them away from convictions and away. And, and, and can I just say some, some of you young guys need to cling to old guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just find an old guy and hang on. And, but anyway, old guys, they're boring. Yeah, they've figured out how to do it. Um, you'd rather sit and have someone ask you how to do it who've never done it. Now, uh, in, the, in the preaching circles, there's this thing getting popular, having an idea meeting where all the preachers stand around and throw in ideas about how you might build a church, although none of them ever built a church. 
I think I'd rather go to a place where some old guy who's built the church can tell you how he did it and maybe just jump on and do what's always been done. But anyway, what do we know, all right? Yeah, anyway, they zealously, there are people who'd love to pull you. Why would somebody want you to go back and start drinking liquor? What's the point? To make them look better. See, these kids grew up in a Baptist church. Now they're drinking. It's okay. It didn't help you any. No one got helped by drinking booze. See, you young people, the devil's crowd is not looking to help you. He's looking to make his crowd look better by snagging you and bringing you over here. You know, he, he wants you on Facebook with no standards. So he can wave the banner of, see, fundamental Baptists aren't all they're made up to be. Uh, they zealously, that's what he's talking about here. And Paul says, these guys, why would these guys want you to start keeping the law and trying to keep the commandments and the Sabbath and circumcision and all these laws when they're saved by grace? What's the point in all that? To make them look better. Not to help you at all. Go on a little bit. Let's do another verse or two here. He says, it's good in verse 18. It's good to be zealously affected always in a good thing. Duh. Go soul winning more. Run more chariot routes. And... Uh, not only when I'm present with you, my little children, verse 19, my little children whom I travail and birth again until Christ be formed in you. Can I say this? You're trying to raise spiritual children. It's like giving birth. And no man wants to know it. You know, sometimes preachers, brothers, servants, you've been there. It's a lot of work. You knock on doors and meet people at parks and public places and you get a few saved and you try to grow them in grace and, and they're, they're dumb as a rock and, and everything in the world's pulling on them and it is like childbirth. That's the, the analogy God uses to bring a Christian up in the things of the Lord. To, to start a church... That's why we try. I know we don't have enough money to help everybody. We try to help everybody we can that's starting a church. I just say, man, if you're willing to go somewhere and start a church um, all on your own, good grief, send them money. Pray for them. Pray that they don't lose their marriage or their kids or their brains. And Paul said, this whole thing, I've, he said, I've travailed. Look at that verse there um, in verse 19. My little children who might travail in birth again, and look at the last phrase, till Christ be formed in you. It doesn't get easier. Some of you with adult children, it's harder, right? I mean, Brother Ms. Beale, they look at Caleb and think, oh, Lord. <laughs> you know, you, you worry about your kids, you worry about your grandkids. You're going to travail. I mean, right? John and Sandra, you got these handsome, good-looking, perfect boys and some girl, right? And you think, oh, God, help them get the right girl. <laughs> you travail in pain over that stuff. Help them get the right job and help them, help them not get messed up in sin. And Boy, so, as they get older and they get liberty, you just think, oh, help them not be stupid like their dad. <laughs> Or their mom, or whatever, depending on who's doing the praying. Oh, the, the, the anxiety inside us goes on and on. In verse 20, he says, I desire to be present with you. I wish I could just walk with you to class and walk with you here and there. But you know, parents, we can't. We just can't. At some point, you've got to love them and teach them and train them and say, see ya. Come by at Thanksgiving. You've always got a friend. You've always got somebody that loves you, but uh, we can't make their decisions for them. In fact, the fact is most of the young people in this room are already too old for you to be making their decisions. Uh, and how are you going to convince a 14-year-old? You're going to spank a 14-year-old, and can, they're going to laugh at you, and then you're going to kill them. Uh, it's, you, you just got to say, I desire to be present with you. I wish I could walk with you, but you know what? I'm just going to commit you to God. And um, it's a good life, this Christian life. But we got to rest in him. He'll take care of it. Father, bless us as we go. Thank you for your book. I pray you'd teach us from it, remind us of it often. And may these simple truths get a little bit more clear in our mind. 
And as we read our Bibles, may one scripture remind us of another, that we could walk with you and talk with you and, and know you better. Bless us, bless our families, bless our school, bless our college students. And during the holidays, may we be conscious and attentive of those around us. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.